I'm going to do a little introductory speaking tonight. We'll get into our hardcore themes on tomorrow night and then on Sunday morning. I'm going to be speaking on the subject of curse breaking tomorrow night. Some of you know one of the 35 books which I've written is simply entitled Curse Breaking. How many of you have this book? Actually, quite a few. All right. So we're going to explain to you tomorrow night what a curse is and why it is so important to break the curses in your life. Even the curses you don't know that you have. And then we'll move on from those themes into other spiritual warfare topics on Sunday morning. Now, many of you watch me on YouTube, and many of you have attended our conferences, and, and you've watched us cast out demons. How do people get demons? How does an individual become the repository of evil spirits to the extent they need an exorcist? I've documented 40,000. That's 40,000 cases of demonic possession over my ministerial career in 100 countries. That's a lot. I heard a preacher, famous preacher, you'd all know his name, state recently in a national article in a Christian magazine that he'd only met five people in his whole life who were demonically possessed. You know this person, highly respected. You watch him on TV, you may have read his books. And in his ministry, he's met five. I meet five in a day, not a lifetime. And many times people come to me and they say, Pastor Bob, I don't know if I have demons or not. You tell me. <laughs> You're the exorcist. Do I have demons? Now, there's a whole process that I take people through. But there's some very basic things that I want to know about an individual. If you're here tonight and you have demons, you may not even know it. In fact, most people don't. Forget what you see in Hollywood. That's not anywhere near the reality of demonic possession. The majority of people don't know they have demons. At the very least, they might suspect that strange things are happening to them. Some years ago, the New York Times was interviewing me and asked me a question, and I made a statement off the cuff. I guess I should have been more careful talking to the most mad newspaper in America. They said, what percentage of the population do you think have demons? And I said to them, 50%. And later I thought, how stupid could I be? It's at least 75 or 80, maybe 90. Pastor Bob, are you suggesting that at least 50% of these people here tonight have demons? Oh, I forgot. You're Christians. You can't have demons. Some of you, your pastor told you so. That famous radio or television evangelist told you so. You can't have demons. You're a Christian. You're a blood-bought child of Jesus. And when you come to the cross and you are covered by the blood of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you cannot, I say you cannot, ever have a demon. Sister, you're just not praying enough. You're not tithing enough. So if this is mostly a Christian audience, then how could it be possible that half of you have demons? They're hiding, waiting, lurking in dark corners. I have an interesting family. As I said, you'll meet my beautiful 22-year-old oldest daughter tomorrow. I owe a great deal of credit to my 
wonderful wife who has homeschooled all three children. It's quite a thing in this day and age to have three beautiful daughters, 22, 18, 15, who are virgins and love Jesus. <laughs> it doesn't happen much these days. And they've watched this ministry through the years. And they've seen the most unsuspecting people come across my path. Try to kill me. Attack me. Manifest violently. Speak in strange languages. And do some really weird things. They're believers. But how can that be? We'll not solve that issue tonight. But I do want to point out to you one crucial, basic, fundamental fact of spiritual warfare. Job chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, Where do you, where do you come from? So the devil said, From going to and fro on the earth and walking back and forth. He's a very busy guy. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on earth? A blameless and upright man, one that fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? And here the devil is before the Lord and he's saying, give me a break, God. The only reason Job serves you is all the goodies you give him, the benefits. Have you not made a hedge around him, his household, and around all that he has? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. Now, most of you know the rest of this story. We won't go into it, but the devil said there was a hedge, or there was a, a barrier of protection around Job. And that's what was keeping the devil back. What is that hedge? What is that barrier? What is that protection? And how does the devil get past it? Now, as I said a moment ago, I have three daughters and my wonderful wife has four women and four cats. All female. <laughs> Who do I talk to about Thursday night football? I used to hate cats. But when I married my wife, a cat came with her. What are you going to do? You're in love. The cat's part of the package. I've learned to like cats. There's much to be said for cats. They have one amazing characteristics. And this characteristic is very different from dogs. It's patience. Dogs aren't patient, you know that. You come in the room, they start barking, bop, 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 bop. they yap. They... I know, we have a big dog and a little dog, a 90-pounder and a 5-pounder. Belgian Melawa, watchdog, highly trained, he'll get you if you come after me, and a chihuahua, who's really the most dangerous, or at least sounds like it. And one of those is female, too. But back to the cats. You know, dogs are here, there, and everywhere, but cats, you ever watch them? How many cat lovers do we have? <laughs> You're noisier for your cat than you were for Jesus. <laughs> okay. Are they not patient creatures? Let one insect or one bird fly by the window and that cat will pop up there and sit there for hours thinking it's coming back. Right? So in 1 Peter 5, when the Bible says the devil is a roaring lion, seeks about, uh, walks about seeking whom he may devour, he's talking about the patience. Peter's referring to how patient Satan is to just keep circling, trying to find you. And here's what he's looking for. He's looking for a way to get you. Now, how's he going to get you? We all come into this world with a hedge, a barrier of protection. It's God-given. 
It is the innocence of our inheritance as a human being. We are born in innocence. Satan wants to get past your innocence and destroy your life. Because, you know, John 10, 10 says he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. How does the devil get past your innocence? Well, there are several ways. And it's the ways that you get demons. So follow me carefully. This is not going to be complicated. Three basic ways. Satan gets past the hedge. And he's able to influence your life. To oppress you. Possess you. Christian or non-Christian. Let's just forget that spurious argument. Christians can and do have demons. 40,000 exorcisms, 95% of them are born again Christians. The documentation is there. Your favorite preacher who tells you Christians can't have demons has never cast out one. Let alone 40,000. Probably never done an exorcism or five. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He may be talented, gifted, and capable and anointed in other areas. Great. But don't listen to somebody who doesn't have empirical knowledge to back up what they believe when they get into a realm that is not exactly clear in scripture, such as the practical aspects of actually casting out a demon. Now, very simply put, here's three ways. And just for a couple of minutes, I'm gonna to speak to you on a simple theme. The theme is this. Get your stuff before your stuff gets you. Get your stuff before your stuff gets you. Okay? Thank you. We have a Zen Buddhist among us, the sound of one hand clapping. Thank you, sir. Get your stuff. Say it with me. Get your stuff. Before your stuff, get you. Let's try it again. Get your stuff. Before your stuff, get you. Now you got stuff. You all got stuff. And most of you have stuffed your stuff. And you're not dealing with your stuff. And it'll get you. And Satan is patient and he will lurk, he will prowl, and he will wait for a time to attack. I don't care how well you think you're doing now. I don't care how on fire you are for Christ now. If you got stuff, it's going to come back to bite you in the you know what sooner or later. And it won't be pretty. So let's get rid of it. Now, three basic ways. You get your stuff. We'll talk more about this tomorrow, but you, number one, inherit it from your ancestors. Now, I could give you a long treatise on that. I could give you an extensive biblical apologetic, but we don't have time for that. Read my book on curse breaking. It's all there. But when the Bible speaks about the sins being visited under the third and fourth generation... When the Bible talks about the generational propensity and inclination toward evil that many of you were born with, that's what it's talking about. Some of you were born with demons. When sperm met egg, you got demons. They've always been with you. You don't know what it's like to be without them. You have normalized your possession. It's a way of life. You have made friends with your demons. Now listen to me. 
They're so much a part of you, you don't know what's them and what's you. And unless somebody like me comes along and confronts it, you'll go on your way thinking you're okay. And all that stuff is there. So your ancestors passed that stuff on to you. Generational family curses. We now know in terms of modern science with the genome project and DNA and genetics how this works. You get my new book. I have some fascinating information in dealing with demons about the most recent research into the inheritance of trauma. Now, I've known this for decades as a practical matter, casting out demons, that you inherit the trauma of your ancestors. Your great, 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 whatever was raped or incested or molested. And it's been happening to every single woman or man in the bloodline for hundreds of years. It hit you, it hit mom, it hit grandma. It's in the blood, it's in the genetics. Read the studies that I quote in that book from modern neuroscience that is now validating what those of us who teach curse breaking have known for a very long time. That stuff is there. You got it when you were born. And unless you've gone through a deliverance process, it's still there. Everybody needs deliverance. That's the utter ludicrousity, no stupidity of the evangelical church in America that we don't need this. Everybody needs it. Everybody needs some type of deliverance process that introspectively goes through prayers, dealing with the stuff in your life and renouncing the evil of your ancestors. Your ancestors raped, your ancestors killed, your ancestors incested. They worship false God, they made human sacrifice, they entered into blood covenants. Everyone in this room has someone in the bloodline who did that. You've either dealt with it, brought it to the cross, renounced it, and been freed from it, or you haven't. Now, not everybody who has a generational curse has a demon, granted. But you'll never know if you do until you start breaking the curses. And sometimes I sit down with people, and pastor knows what I'm talking about, you don't get very far. You start leading them in a curse-breaking prayer, and you're about 60 seconds sometimes five seconds into it and they're manifesting a demon because you're challenging the power base of that generational demon who's hanging on to that stuff. Get your stuff, your stuff's going to get you. So number one, get rid of the stuff that was handed you by your ancestors. Secondly, Get rid of the stuff that was given to you by those in authority over you. Primarily parrots, but it could be a pastor. Or any significant individual to whom you ceded authority by allowing them in some way to speak over your life in some type of soul bond, soul tie, or connection. Most generally, though, that's going to be a parent. So everybody in this room was basically raised by affirming, loving parents or non-affirming, non-loving parents. And those in the latter category may have had it even worse. Your parents may have mocked, ridiculed, belittled, or verbally, God forbid, sexually abused you. Well, what's that all about? Your parents cursed you. When your parents told you you were stupid, you were never going to mount anything, they opened the door to demons. There was no hedge left. There was no implicit innocence that you were born with. They shoved it aside. God gave you innocence at birth. But if your parents 
speak curses over you, the protection of that innocence is invalidated. Because your parents have the right to speak blessing or cursing to you. If they speak curses, there's an open door to the devil. This is not complicated. So, the stuff that's in your life may be there because your ancestors passed it on to you. Your parents declared it over you. Or you opened the door. You invited your own stuff in. And believe me, there are a lot of people here tonight who have opened a lot of doors to a lot of stuff. But Pastor Bob, my, my pastor told me, my, my, my favorite radio preacher told me when I got saved, that's all dealt with. He lied. Lied? Let's just say that he was injudicious in evaluating the complexities of the eschatological significance of your life in terms of the ebb and flow of circumstances. Make you feel better? But he lied to you because he didn't know what he was talking about. See, when you become a child of God, your sins are forgiven. That's cool. You're going to heaven. You live like hell, but you're going to heaven. Why do you live like hell? Because you got stuff. Nobody told you to get rid of your stuff. Nobody said, get saved, get rid of your stuff. What does that mean, Pastor Bob? It means you can be a Christian. Bought by the blood of Jesus. But not sanctified. Not clean, not holy, not quite fixed yet. A work in progress. And while you're a work in progress, there may be areas of your life where you open doors to Satan before you became a Christian. And those doors have never really been closed. I was so touched by this dear lady's testimony and I can't remember you, but I do remember you in Portland. <laughs> and, and the things that she's doing to close the doors, getting involved in rehab, staying clean, getting a good education, doing things that gets rid of the stuff, positive steps in her life. But many people get saved. Come on, Pastor Blad knows exactly what I'm talking about. Other pastors here know exactly what I'm talking about. People get saved and that's it, man. They don't go anywhere. They stop dead. The stuff stays there. It ferments. It becomes toxic. And it'll destroy you. It'll kill you. If you don't get rid of your stuff. We're not asking you to confess your sins all over again. If you're a Christian. We're saying, dig down and ask the Holy Spirit if there's an area of your life where you open the door to the devil that has never been fully closed, such as an addiction. Excellent example. You've never renounced that addiction. You've never broken its hold. And if there's a demon attached to it, you've never gotten rid of that demon of addiction. And particularly for those of you who have any kind of background in any form of the occult or new age. And I see this on a daily basis. People get saved. They, you know, they went to a psychic. Well, I'm saved. What's the big deal here? Well, that sin of witchcraft still has power in your life to torment you. And you may have gotten demons by going to that psychic and those demons didn't go anywhere when you got saved. Well, where are they? Well, they're not in your spirit. That belongs to Jesus, but they're hiding in your thoughts, your feelings, and your emotions. They're in your mind. They're in your psyche. They're in your soul. And they're not going 
until somebody tells them to go. I said, Pastor Bob, I've watched you on YouTube, and you get up there, you pace back and forth, you get that cross, you yell at those demons. Why do you do that? Because some demons don't go until you tell them to go. They don't leave until you make them leave. So that's my job. And because of it, Satan has one of these hanging in hell. Right next to a wanted poster of me. And my job is to put yours right next to mine. To challenge the demons. To get to your stuff. Get the stuff out of you. In simple terms, you really don't know how good being a Christian can be. If what you have now you think is good, just imagine if you got delivered how good good could be. You just don't know it. You've settled for so much less than you have to settle for. Now, you've got to hear me on this. You may be in this band. You may be one of the singers. You could be one of the ushers. And you love Jesus. You really are sold out to God as far as you know how to be. But the stuff is hiding. Nobody ever explained to you how to get rid of it. Nobody ever challenged it. Thank God for this pastor. Thank God for a hungry generation. Thank God for a bunch of people who are challenging the devil and not letting you keep your stuff. Come on, amen. Well, I'm one more person that's come along to challenge it.